Hello everyone and welcome back to Quantum Investing. For those who are new to the channel, the channel is about small and medium-sized companies which have strong credentials and really solid outlook potential. And so from time to time, we're excited about the opportunity to be able to talk to their CEOs and presidents to understand what's going on in the companies which are on the brink of really big things. And here today we have one of such. And our guest on the channel today is Jeff Klender, the chairman, president and CEO of UR Energy, which prides itself as one of the lowest cost uranium mine producers. UR Energy is listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker number URG, and also on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker number URE. Jeff, I'm so happy to have you on the channel. How are you doing? Doing very well. Thanks for having me this morning, or this afternoon. Great stuff, Jeff. Again, loads going on, Jeff. But before we dive into the detail in terms of what's happening in the company or the sector, I believe that people are what made the company, right? So let's yeah. start with you. You know, tell me about yourself and how you got into uranium, you know, and what got you interested in the sector? Well, uh, I've been a lifelong investor. In fact, I'm, I'm uh, in one of these people who uh, has been a serial company starter. I took my first company public when I was 28 years old. And as you can see, I'm a good deal older than that now. Yeah. But uh uh, actually, uh, I, I really, I, I've always been a lifelong kind of natural resource investor. And uh, I was on a series of boards with a group of guys out of Ottawa and Toronto. And this was back in 2004. And they said, look, you know, uranium is going to be the next great thing. We want to start a uranium company. I said, no, 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 I don't want anything to do with it. I don't know anything about uranium. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that was 17 years ago. And uh, uh it didn't make the story shorter. They, you know, I resisted, but they dragged me kicking and screaming into it. And so we started a uranium company. It was a truly a greenfields company, but uh, uh, we, uh, we, we were able to secure very good properties. And we spent the first seven, eight years as a, as a permitting and licensing story. But the last eight years as a producer, we, we built out our processing plant. And as you noted in our introduction, uh, we've become one of the lowest cost producers globally outside of Kazadam from. So uh, we feel very, very good about our role in the industry and feel that in particular, this is just a great time to be uh, in the uranium space after 10 tough years post Fukushima. So uh, what, our time is due. What a timing, right? I mean, we'll delve into that in a moment. But when people hear about uranium, you know, they talk about all they think about immediately is around nuclear reactions nuclear reactors, ammunition, but there's a lot more to it than that. So why don't we just share with the viewers what your company is all about, you know, and what gets you ticking outside what people are traditionally understanding to be? Well, first of all, I think that it's important to understand what type of mining we do. We are in situ miners. And so that means that we're solution miners. So what we do is we use essentially a highly oxygenated bicarbonate of soda, an alkaline solution. So it's not the acid solutions that's used around the globe, particularly in, Ka in Kazakhstan. Uh, ours is, a, is very benign um, uh, eluent, uh, or excuse me, uh, lixivient that is pumped into the ground. So what we do is that we pump this lixivient, this highly oxygenated Perrier water, essentially, into the subsurface. It dissolves the uranium in place or in situ. We then pump out that... Uh, impregnated solution where it comes into ion exchange columns. It's loaded onto millions of tiny little polymer beads where the uranium bonds to those beads. It's then separated in the elution circuit and then ultimately it's precipitated, the water is taken out of it and it's filter pressed and dried and packaged. And it goes out the back door in the form of yellow cake in drums that weigh about 875 pounds. And when we have contracts in roughly the $50 range, they go out the back door at $43,000, $44,000 a barrel, and that's our business model. So we deliver them to the converter who then delivers to the utility. So uh, we are at the very front end of the fuel cycle, but we are very environmentally friendly. And uh, once we are finished with a mine unit, it is fully restored and, and it is uh, eligible for any form of use, surface use, including uh, watering, feed cattle, um, anything else. So there's really no restrictions and it's uh, very environmentally friendly. And right now, more than 50% of global primary production is done via in situ. So it is definitely the, the production, the preferred production method of the future. 
Yeah, and it's quite obvious in terms of why you're such a lower cost producer as well. And they've it is a low cost form of production. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And behind yourself, behind Jeff, tell me a bit more about your team. How are you structured to make all of this work? Well, I'll tell you, one of the, the, I'm glad you asked that because it is one of the things that differentiates us from our peers in the industry. Uh, we have been struggling through what I call the post-Fukushima environment, which occurred, occurred, uh, occurred on March 11th of 2011. So that was more than 10 years ago. During that time, our industry has been characterized by excess uh, supply and a paucity of demand because immediately when the Japanese took all of their reactors offline, it caused uh, it, 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 14% of demand went away overnight. So uh, it's been a, indeed a very tough time to be in the nuclear space and in uranium in particular. But one of the things that we did is that we were able to not only complete our permitting and licensing during that time, we were able to ramp up our production. We have been in production for the last eight years. There are only, it's important to understand there are only two, react, uh, two uranium producers remaining in the United States right now, ourselves and one other company. Right. But one of the things that we've done over the last few years is that we have kept our operational staff in place. And these are very highly specialized, very uh, highly technical uh, individuals and the fact is, is that if we release them, you, they're, they're going to scatter to the four winds and you can't replace them. And so right now there is a, there's a real lack of, of genuine expertise, individuals with expertise in our industry. So we've been very fortunate in that we are operating as lean and clean as, as any time that we have over the last 15 years. But we've got a core uh, executive team in place that's all in the prime of their careers and uh, is very money conscious. But in addition to that, we've retained our operational staff, which gives us the ability to ramp up quickly should we be able to get contracts. And we think that we're on the cusp of a new contracting cycle, which is about to occur in the uranium space. Inventories are getting very, very low. Interesting time. So there's that continuity and talent within your team, which over time has built that expertise. Quite very, very much so. And as a matter of fact, the people that are, are with us now, uh, almost all of them have been with us for in excess of 10 years. And even on our board of directors, there's a great deal of continuity. We have seven directors in the company, mm -hmm. but uh, five of them have been with the company for more than 12 years. So Yes, we are, uh, you know, we're a company that has been able to stay together and, and continue to function and really thrive even during a very difficult time because we put contracts in place back in 2011, 12, 13, and 14 that took us all the way through the last decade. And so that gave us cash flows. It gave us stability. It enabled us to not dilute our shareholders and also allowed us to build inventory. So that is another element of our company. Those long-term contracts that we had in place for 10 years or the last eight years mm -hmm. that really differentiated us from our peers in the marketplace. There's been loads going on in the company that the market has begun to take notice of uh, your energy. So much that over the last six months, your share price has appreciated by over 150% compared to the last five years. Any insights in terms of what may have driven that good return? Well, let, me, let me start by saying that, uh, that yes, that's correct. Uh, and, and actually, if you go back seven, eight months, we were, we were at 45 cents a share. We're now at roughly $1.60. And so uh, there has, it's, uh, the, the, uh, the percentage gain has probably even been a bit higher than that. Mm -hmm. But relative to our, some of our peers, we've actually been, um, we've been underperforming the space in terms of stock price. I think that we've come from a period of such extreme undervaluation, not just ourselves, the entire space, mm -hmm. that I think we, we, this was something that was long overdue. But more recently, you've seen movement in our stock price over the course of the last month or so because we passed on May 6th, May 7th, the uh, Russell 2000 re-rank date. And we were fairly confident that we made it into the Russell. And, and there are a lot of companies, the, uh, the uh, index funds, that they start looking at which companies they think are in, which companies are out. And they'll start selling the companies that are out. And they'll start buying the companies that are in. 
Uh, we received formal notice a week ago today that we are uh, going to be added onto the Russell. Yeah. And uh, we've been on the Russell three times prior. So this will be our fourth time. Hopefully it'll be a charm. But uh, when you go onto the Russell, roughly 140 index funds must own your stock. And this has to occur by the reconstitution date which takes place on June 25th. So just two weeks from today. Yeah. So one of the reasons that our stock price has been performing quite well is that not only has it been just the renewed interest and excitement in the uranium space, and quite candidly, we did not expect this current administration in the United States to be the friend of nuclear that they have proven to be. Yeah. That was quite unexpected to us. Uh, so that has been very beneficial. But now getting on to the Russell, let's face it, when 140 index funds must own your stock, that's going to give you a lift. And the prior three times that I was on the Russell, we finished each and every one of those years as either the number one or number two performer in the uranium space. So uh, it makes a substantial difference. And so we're looking very much forward to the reconstitution date two weeks from now, but it's a great time to be part of our registry. Absolutely. Congratulations, Jeff. And I look forward Thank to the updates on the back of that. Yeah. Exciting times. So let, let's talk about your two main projects at the moment. There's the Lost Creek project and there's also the Shirley Basin project, which yes. are really your price assets. Can you tell us a bit more in terms of where you've got to on there? And again, forward looking, what can investors envisage you hear from you in terms of key milestones over the next six to 12 months? Well, I think that, first of all, key milestones are going to be contingent on a couple of things. First of all, we are waiting. One of the things that very good that happened in December of last year is that we saw the uh, an appropriation for $75 million from our Congress to stand up a strategic uranium reserve here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So now we could see the government coming in and buying material directly from the uranium producers in the U.S. It has to be produced in the United States. But in addition to that, what we're seeing is that we're seeing more buying coming into the marketplace and things have, have fundamentally changed uh, where I believe that inventories are getting so low right now that the utilities will be forced to come into the market. Now, this is a forward-looking statement. I have nothing to base this on other than my gut instincts, but I do believe that the utilities will be coming into the market in the second half of the year, beginning a new contracting cycle. So to get to your question, what that means to us is that we have our operational staff on, on hand. They're ready to go. They're waiting for the green light to step on the gas and, and start ramping up production. And so we're prepared to begin that at any time. So the milestones will really be around the uranium reserve and new contracting that we would enter into with the utilities. But as for Lost Creek as a flagship property, it's proven to just be a beast. I mean, we uh, demonstrated that we can produce there in the low $16 range on a C1 cash level with an all-in cost of about $25. Now, this is a forward-looking statement, but if I were to be able to get contracts that would enable me to ramp production at Lost Creek to a million, million and a quarter pounds per year, it would put me in a position where I believe we can get our C1 cash cost down to about $12 a pound all in costs, all in sustaining costs to about $20 a pound or under. That makes us far and away the lowest cost producer in North America. And we believe the lowest cost producer outside of Kazakhstan. Now take a look at Shirley Basin. Shirley Basin, we just received all of our permits and licenses on that. That was announced just three weeks ago. And that really had a profound impact on us because what that permitting allowed us to do and that new license allowed us to do is effectively double our licensed production capacity. So it was 2.2 million pounds per year out of Lost Creek. It's now 4 million pounds when we add in Shirley Basin. And keep in mind, Shirley Basin was a former producer. We bought this from the French giant Arriva, now Arano. And this what they formerly produced there. So this is not a Greenfields project. It's extremely well drilled out. We it, The resource is extremely well defined. And what's more important is that a great deal of the infrastructure is in place. Roads are in place, water's in place, electricity is in place, and the outbuildings still exist from the old production there. So for us, when we get the green light, we can build out our satellite plant there and be in production in as little as four to five months. So uh, we have the ability to ramp to 
a 2 million pounds per year run rate in about 18 months between Lost Creek and Shirley Basin. But most importantly, even if you were just to focus on Lost Creek, from where we are today, Mm -hmm. for as little as $15 million, I can ramp from basically zero production or very nominal production on care and maintenance where we are today Mm -hmm. to a million pounds per year run rate. I can do that for $15 million in approximately six months time, which means I can do it faster and at lower cost than any of our peers which should translate into less dilution for our shareholders as well. So this is the strategic advantage that we have over all of our peers. I want to dig into that in a moment, but yeah, just hold that thought, because that's really, there's a lot which makes you quite unique and exciting, but really, I wonder if you really capture that so it's really clear for everyone else watching this. Really good stuff. And talking about backers, right, who are those behind? We've spoken about yourself, the team behind, uh, your management team. In terms of shareholders, we recognize that you are one of the biggest individual shareholders of the company, I am. which is good to see because we love to see uh, management who have got skin in the game. So that's fantastic to know and hear. But who else? Are there any other big backers whom uh, you feel sh- um, potential investors need to be aware of? Well, we have actually, um, um, first of all, I, I thank you for, for mentioning that because you know, oftentimes when you see management with large shareholder positions, that's odd, that's regarded as being oh so good because management is aligned with the shareholders. Well, it's good if they actually bought in the marketplace. It's not so good if they just issued themselves a ton of shares at a half a penny a share when they formed the company. Yeah. We didn't do that. I've got uh, three and a half, nearly four million dollars of my own company, of my own money in this company. So I'm a big believer in eating my own cooking. But we have excellent support from large institutional investors. Um, I think this is a matter of public record, so I don't mind naming them. M- MM Capital, who is a huge uh, investor in uranium across the board, is one of our largest shareholders. CQS out of London. We have a wide ver- uh, number, a large number of institutional investors, particularly, um, it may say, it sound strange, but out of Miami, because one of our big institutional shareholders is there. And they brought in a number of other family offices and institutions that they work with in the, in the aggregate. They control more than 20% of our shares. So we are more than 50% held by institutions. And But more, than, more importantly, what we have is we have a small group of both bankers and institutional investors that I can call upon for financing at any time. Um, I have never had a, a diff- any difficulty raising money. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit peculiar in that regard in that uh, I like to know my shareholders. Yeah. So even though I bring in a syndicate of bankers when we do registered offerings, uh, I usually provide a president's list that constitutes about 65 to 70%. I still pay the bankers. Yeah. But they're my shareholders because I like to know them. And that's why when we just did our AGM the week before last, uh, I received 99.52% of the vote. I don't even think Warren Buffett gets that. So uh, that's a function of knowing your shareholders and being very, very happy and having good long-term fundamental shareholders that you can rely on. No, useful to know, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I want us to shift now from the company looking at the macro side of it, and really yes. I'm just going to combine a number of questions into one. Yeah. We look at uranium. It's on the critical minerals list for the United States. Biden's administration, pro-nuclear. You know, so look, putting all of that together, what does that mean for your energy and the outlook of uranium over the next five years? Well, first of all, let me, I think that that's a great question, and you have to, I mean, if for any investor, you have to focus on the macro. Yeah. And particularly, let's face it, we're a commodity. We're, we, now, we're the most highly politicized commodity in the world. Yeah. That's just a fact of life. We have to, we have to live with that. And that's good. that can be good and that can be bad. But you have to concentrate on the fundamentals. Now, let's face it, uh, the fundamentals have not been good over the last 10 years, but that started to change about three years ago. We are now in our third year of structural deficit in uranium that exceeds 50 million pounds per year. Give you an example. In 2019, global consumption of uranium was 187 million pounds, but global primary production was only 139 million pounds, hence a 58 million pound structural deficit. Now, that had to be made up for by above ground inventories or what are called secondary supplies. 
Last year, that number was 56 million pounds. This year, in 2021, because of COVID last year, only three or four new reactors came online. We are anticipating 12 to 15 new large reactors coming online this year, which should further increase demand. So we have entered into a time where we are now in our third year this year, we could see 60 plus million pounds of structural deficit in uranium. So fundamentally, things have changed from a supply demand standpoint. So where we are seeing projected continued growth in uranium demand and projected continued structural deficits in uranium. So this has changed things fundamentally from a supply to demand standpoint. Now, politically, when you talk about the new administration coming in in the United States, look, we all saw what happened in Texas. Uh, I mean, a deep freeze and wind and solar not only failed, they failed spectacularly. They failed 100%. Uh, were it not for nuclear, several hundred more people would have died down there, just simply frozen to death. Nuclear saved that state. And I think that that was a big eye opener. But I think that most importantly, the Nuclear Fuel Working Group, which was structured by Donald Trump, put out a report in, on April 23rd of 2020, a little more than a year ago, that had 18 recommendations. And now this was seven government agencies, two scientific uh, panels, uh, the NRC, FERC, and two members of the White House. So 13 individuals in all. And they came out with an analysis of the nuclear fuel, they're called the Nuclear Fuel Working Group. Of the 18 recommendations that they came out with, 11 of them have now been adopted by the Biden administration as core to their clean energy agenda. So I think that it's critical to understand that the this administration, and as I mentioned, it surprised us, but this administration recognizes that there is no way that you are going to meet clean energy or climate change objectives by 2040 or 2050 without nuclear. It will not happen. It simply will not happen. So some exciting times ahead, Jeff. Uh, very much so. So if we were to take all of what you've just said, Jeff, I mean, the macro side of things, and then applying it on your energy, which is low cost, has a strong cash position right now, on mm -hmm. diluted shareholder base, and uh, some of the unique uh, competitive strengths around your permits and authorizations, which you've already got. So it just feels like the right recipe for a takeover target, right? Does that worry you? Uh, how should I answer this? Um, all right, you're, you're, you're touching on a, 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 I don't, one of these topics I don't like to talk about, but I will be candid. I, I'm, I'm known for that. Uh, we have actually seen four offers for the company in the last four years, uh, two of them from other companies in our industry, two of them from private equity. Um, all of them were opportunistic for the would-be acquirer and uh, not in what I would consider to be the best interest of our shareholders. So while, yes, we are regarded, let's face it, um, if, there's a, if there's a cleaner, lower cost story out there, with lower, I mean, we have really watched dilution. We are fanatical about it. We do not dilute our shareholders unless absolutely necessary. But if there's a cleaner, more exciting, pure energy play out there in the industry, I'd like to know who it is. And I know every other player in the industry, and uh, I wouldn't trade places with any of them. So does that make us a takeover target at some point? Likely it does. And that's why we get the inbounds and offers on the company on a fairly regular basis. But there is nothing of that sort in, uh, uh, in the offing right now, nothing on the table. But on the other hand, the other side of that equation would be, are we in the market for acquisition? The answer to that is yes. We're always looking to expand our footprint. And if the right acquisition were to come along, we're very interested. Uh, we're, a, we're a very clean story. We can ramp to a very strong level of production right now. But, you know, the, uh, the whole idea is to increase shareholder value. And if I can find a great acquisition that would be accretive to my shareholders, you bet we're going to take a look at it. No, again, UR Energy has got some exciting fundamentals right now. And hence why we're talking to you. So thanks for being candid and honest to that, Jeff. Yes. And just really summarizing, I'm conscious of your time as well, putting all of that together, why should anyone watching this for the first time, never heard about your energy, consider investing in the company? 
Well, I think, first of all, it would start with a macro. From a macro standpoint, I think that it's important to understand that fundamentally things have changed. Not only have they changed politically, but let's face it, money is starting to pour into the industry right now. If you take a look at the 50 largest uranium companies out there in the world right now, it comes to a total market cap of $29 billion. That's nothing. Uh, the last time around, during the last uranium renaissance, that number was $150 million. It's going to go much, much larger this time. So not only has there been a, a, a fundamental change in terms of supply-demand, politically, the um, sentiment is definitely changing. Money is flowing into the industry. And right now, there's competition for the utilities to buy uranium. That's going to come from not only the United States government, but let's face it, spot buying UPC is a big deal because they are going to, once they set up that physical uranium trust, they're going to be on the spot market every week. And the utilities have multi-year low inventory. So I think that uh, right now things have changed. The Chinese are building out at a breakneck pace. In fact, they themselves have said that by 2040, they will consume the entire amount of uranium currently being produced worldwide. Wow. So is it a good time to be getting on the uranium train? Yes, absolutely. I don't think there's any question about that. And the utilities have to start contracting soon. So it's going to elevate spot price. But when you talk about us in particular, I think that the reason to become a uranium, a your energy shareholder and become part of our registry is one, we're getting on the Russell. That's going to mean that 140 index funds have to come in and own us. But in addition to that, and more importantly, I can ramp up to 2 million pounds per year. I can do it in a shorter time period for less money and more importantly, less dilution than any of my peers. And, and uh, I know every one of my peers, so I can state that unequivocally. So we are in a unique position. As I stated earlier, I wouldn't trade positions with any one of them. So to summarize, not only has the macro environment just done a, three, a 180 and has completely turned around, but in addition to that, we believe that we have positioned ourselves as the single best position company to take advantage of it and to benefit our shareholders because, let's face it, low cost translates into great margins, great margins turn, translate into profitability for your shareholders. Nobody else is in a better position than we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jeff, so good talking to you. We'd love to have you back on the channel again to follow your story and find out what's going on with your energy. So thank you so much. That was Jeff Klender, Chairman, President, and CEO of Your Energy, ticker number URG for New York Stock Exchange and ticker number URE for the Toronto Stock Exchange. Thank you so much, Jeff, and have a good day. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.